It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Jonathan Palma, who is a pediatrician at the Children's Stanford uh, Hospital. He's also an assistant professor of pediatrics, as well as the medical di director of the clinical informatics in the Stanford uh, Children's Health. Um, so Dr. Palma is going to talk about, about um, the learning health system and what is the US perspectives in uh, a clinical informatics as well as his personal experience as a clinician. Thank you so much. Thanks, Blanca. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. It's great to be here today. I've been in Australia for a few days, so I'm mostly awake uh, at this point. Um, and uh, I'm excited to come. I'm glad that um, you may have met some of my colleagues, I think last year, Natalie and Vina, um, who came by. and. We've uh, all been down in Melbourne helping with the, the go live of their epic EMR at Royal Children's. So I was glad to be able to make, make this side trip. Um, I'm not sure if they shared with you any information about Stanford Children's Health and um, our pediatric environment. So I thought I'd just show this uh, slide with a few numbers on it. Um, basically, uh, in May, uh, about exactly two years ago, um, we turned on our EPIC EMR. We actually migrated from a previous, um, a previous electronic health record um, called Cerner. So we had been electronic for a while, but we did a big migration to kind of uh, integrate the care in our environment because we, we hadn't been electronic in the outpatient clinics. And you can see we have uh, almost half a million outpatient um, pediatric outpatient clinic visits a year that we're responsible for. Um, but uh, part of what I'm most interested in is our almost 5,000 um, births a year that happen at the hospital. So although we're a children's hospital, we are connected to the adult hospital by a labor and delivery unit. So we get a lot of referrals for complex newborn problems, but we get a lot of newborns born right in the, in the hospital too. Um, and I put the little thing about having 80 uh, training programs on there because we recently launched a clinical informatics fellowship training program, which is a newly recognized subspecialty um, in the US. So physicians can do additional training um, and get certified in clinical informatics. So I grandfathered into that because I've been doing clinical informatics for a while. So I took the test and passed. And now I'm the program director for our fellowship. And Vina is one of our first fellows. So she's, she's graduating in, in July. And I know still has uh, thoughts of coming out here to join Enrico, but other, uh, other family matters have her uh, sticking closer to home right now. <laughs> um, so I, I wanted to start with sort of the, the landscape of um, clinical informatics in the US a bit, because what I want to get to, and I, and I know many of you are familiar with the concept of a learning healthcare system, um, maybe even more so than some of my colleagues in the States, um, it seems. Um, but what, one thing that I'm interested in is, you know, how, how do you really bridge kind of the innovative things going on in biomedical informatics departments to the bedside. Um, and I think clinical informatics people are the, sort of the, the bridging people to help that. And so I'm going to talk about a couple, a couple clinical informatics tools that I think can help um, facilitate this transfer of information and you know, making this more of a reality or at least some examples um, for our patients. So in 1999, um, and I realize I don't see my notes here, but luckily I sort of remember what I'm talking about. Um, the Institute of Medicine uh, released this report called To Air is Human. And um, the Institute of Medicine is a private group that works pretty closely with government in the US to help drive policy. Um, so th this report um, suggested that we may be killing up to 100,000 patients a year as a result of preventable medical errors. So that was you know, quite shocking to the public and um, raised a lot of concern to people providing health care. Um, a couple, not because they don't just raise the problem, they suggest uh, ways to address the problem. The Institute of Medicine uh, published Crossing the Quality Chasm in 2001 to outline some strategies to address these preventable medical errors. So one of those strategies was implementation of electronic health records to help us provide uh, safer care for our, for our patients. Um, so a lot of people in the US point to uh, legislation that I'll share here from 2009 um, uh, on a couple of government bills that uh, are sort of colloquially known as the High Tech Act that 
infused a lot of money um, into healthcare to drive the adoption of these um, health record, electronic health record systems. But it's really those reports back in 2001 and two uh, 99 and 2001 that started driving the adoption in, in the US um, of electronic health record systems. So this American Recovery, uh, Recovery and Reinvestment Act um, has sort of long-lasting legislation that started for the first several years to incentivize hospitals to install medical records and use them in a meaningful way. So I'm not sure if you heard of meaningful use, but that's a, that's a buzzword in the United States that, um, you know, it's not necessarily just that you install a computerized provider order entry system. It's that you do, a, you know, a certain number of your orders are done electronically and then you qualify for these incentive payments. Over time, the program was, you know, suggested that it would transition to where you're penalized if you're not doing those things. That third phase um, of meaningful use is sort of uh, it changing um, as we speak, but uh, thankfully it's moving more towards um, trying to drive the provision of value in healthcare rather than, you know, penalizing you for, for not implementing electronic systems. But I just wanted to kind of like set the stage of, of you know, what has driven EMR adoption in, in the U.S. Um, so there is uh, an analytics group that surveys hospitals and keeps an eye on all the hospitals in the U.S. that um, keeps track of what levels of um, EMR adoption have been achieved throughout the country. So starting at stage zero at the bottom where basically no part of your hospital or healthcare is electronic, going all the way up to stage, stage seven where you're a quote unquote paperless environment, this kind of shows on the right hand side the, le the levels of adoption in the US. And so the, part of what I'd probably key you into is, um, is stage four, um, which is the, the right here, the area that says um, CPOE. So that's computerized provider order entry and clinical decision support. So that's what a lot of the evidence in the literature points to as what's necessary to improve patient safety, having computerized orders and clinical decision support sort of guardrails to help patients. And so if you sort of add up everything from, you know, here, uh, here to the top, you can see that that's the, num that's the number of um, hospitals that have installed at least CPOE. And so that's a, a approaching 80% of hospitals. So we're like pretty we have pretty high adoption of electronic health records. So I was actually wondering, Blanca, I should have asked you, and if anybody knows in Australia sort of about what the level of CPOE adoption might be, or if anybody's keeping track of it. But the impression I got is that it's lower than 75 or 80%, but I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know the number. Anybody knows the number? I asked once the New South Wales government to give me the figure, and they said it was politically sensitive and refused, so, but. Um, it's much lower. Yeah. But we don't actually have numbers, do we? Yeah. So, well, you know, that's okay. Because what I'm going to show you now is that it's not just putting in these systems that, that makes a difference. It's how you put them in. And so this, I don't think it's terribly off topic, but it's just one of my favorite papers because uh, I think it's so interesting. Um, so this is a, a group uh, led by um, David Klassen, who's a big uh, patient safety researcher in the States. Um, th who did simulation testing um, to see if you put in a variety of computerized orders, would your system catch these errors and prevent the errors from, from getting to patients? Um, and basically what they showed in, uh, in Health Affairs, which is another journal that is highly influential to, to Congress and uh, policymaking in the states, they showed that safety performance varies greatly um, across uh, different hospitals and within different vendor systems. So uh, on the y-axis, you could see this is um, the safety performance of the system. So how many of these errors the system caught? So higher is better. And at the bottom is uh, various EHR vendors in the states. So you know, one of these is Epic, one of them is Cerner. It was blinded in the study. There, there was one uh, where there was only one vendor, which was a homegrown system, um, I believe in Boston. Uh, but, but what you can see is that the top five or six performing um, hospitals were all on different EMR vendors. So the point of this is it's not like one EMR is the best one, because you can also see the variation within a single vendor. Some are you know, quite low performing compared to quite 
high performing. So the message is it's, so it's like how you implement this system and how you use the system that actually drives improvements for, for patients. And so that's a little bit of what I'm going to get into today about ways we might be able to use these systems to um, kind of advance knowledge and um, take care of patients better. Um, so here I'm going to start introducing this idea of a uh, learning health system, which in the U.S. has been um, popularized and really supported by um, Charles Friedman from Michigan. Um, and, you know, he suggests the definition of a learning health system is using electronic health record or electronic medical record data beyond their original purpose of supporting health care of individual patients um, to pro speed the progression of knowledge. Um, so that's a bit of what we're, we're going to get into here. Um, but I'm going to pause and tell a story. Have you seen this slide before from Natalie or Vina? Because we, we tell this story in almost like every, every talk that we give um, because it's a good one. So um, are there any clinicians in the room who can recognize what this sort of, what I would call a Malar rash suggests the diagnosis might be in this patient? Yeah. So. So uh, this is a girl, not the girl we took care of, just a girl from Google Images um, with uh, systemic lupus. It, but the story is about a girl, who, a teenage girl who got admitted to our hospital um, with lupus and um, had a complication of uh, lupus that was affecting her kidneys. It's called lupus nephritis. Um, and she also had pancreatitis. And she also had some markers in her blood that suggested she was at higher risk for clotting than other patients. Um, so the question got raised by her care providers, well, so if she has all these things that are putting her at increased risk of clotting, should we be giving her anticoagulants to decrease that risk? Um, in adult medicine, anticoagulants are used quite regularly to prevent the risk of clotting. In pediatrics, they're not used quite as much um, because generally the risk of clotting isn't as high um, and because there are adverse eff effects like bleeding complications when you thin somebody's blood with these medicines. So um, one of our um, pediatric um, rheumatologists, Dr. Jenny Frankovich, um, did something really interesting that is kind of like a uh, a manual example of a learning health system. So she already had a data set of all the lupus patients seen at our hospital. And so she asked the question of that data set in patients like this one who have nephritis, pancreatitis, these markers of increased clotting, do they tend to clot? And what's the risk of clotting in these patients to try to use that information to help drive the decision of whether we should anti anticoagulate the current patient. So she did that analysis. Um, she deemed that the risk uh, of clotting was sufficiently high. So we did anticoagulate this patient. Um, she ended up not having any adverse effects of the anticoagulation and she ended up not having a clot. So, you know, in the N of one study, things kind of worked out okay. Um, but the point is that sh there was insufficient evidence. Uh, there weren't studies on these types of patients to help guide that decision. If you ask one of your colleagues who's taking care of maybe five or 10 of these patients, you might get a different answer from each of them. So she put together the about 100 patients who fit this profile to try to make a data-driven decision. So that was something really unique and enabled by the fact that all the, these patients' data had been captured electronically. So what I'm going to talk about a little more is the, in the idea of a learning health system, how can you start to, you know, automate the examination of these data to help make clinical decisions when there's uncertainty. Um, so Dr. Longhurst, and I'll share a, a, an example from Blanca and Enrico as well. Um, so Dr. Chris Longhurst was our chief medical information officer at Stanford Children's Health. He's now moved to the uh, University of California uh, health system. Um, where he's now chief information officer, so he's gotten a nice, uh, nice promotion there, and left Natalie and I behind um, at Stanford to do all the work. Um, so he published um, with Nigam Shah, who's one of the researchers at Stanford that Blanca worked with when she visited, um, a paper about the green button for using aggregate patient data at the point of care. And, and the idea of this green button, the concept, is that when you are faced with a patient like that lupus patient, how do you just get the answer? How do you automate that process from the electronic health record to tell you 
what's the risk of clotting to help, um, help you optimize your decision making for that, that patient. Um, so they explain it here in this quote, to help clinicians leverage aggregate patient data for decision making at the point of care to support patient care decisions in the absence of gold standard evidence. So this is something that they term in this paper and we've talked about a little bit um, uh, as rather than calling it evidence-based practice, call it practice-based evidence, like looking at your past practice, learning from it, and applying that to, to future patients. Um, and there's a, there's a really interesting quote in here because, you know, when, unfortunately, to, I, it's sad to admit that when I'm faced with clinical uncertainty, sometimes that results in a Google search. You know, if a PubMed, uh, PubMed is our big kind of like list of uh, medical articles. If, if a search of the medical literature doesn't show me patients or give me an answer that's generalizable to my patient, um, I often result, resort to like a Google search or phoning a friend or at kind of asking them what they would do to try to gather more information. So in their paper, they quoted Donald Rubin um, from you know, 30 years ago now, 40-ish years ago, seems more reasonable to estimate the effects of treatments from non-randomized studies than to ignore these data and dream of the ideal experiment or make armchair decisions without the benefit of data analysis. And I have to say, this is a sort of a controversial topic, I would say, uh, in medicine, because for many years, you know, the idea of evidence-based medicine and doing a you know, double-blind, randomized, controlled study to get the answer you want um, has, has been deemed kind of the gold standard of how to make decisions. It's just that that's not realistic for all patients, particularly for the patients I take care of. I, I would say pediatrics in general is an understudied area, and newborn intensive care is even less studied, somewhat due to the risks for patients, and also because there aren't as many patients to, to study in the first place. So um, I did want to give a little nod to uh, the, the paper that Blanca wrote and Enrico and others in the room, I know. Um, so that uh, f kind of further expanded on these topics uh, in the Journal of Comparative Effectiveness Research last year, um, talking about bringing cohort studies to the bedside. And I, I pulled this, um, this figure from the paper because I think it begins to highlight sort of the complexity of making a system like this a reality. So sort of all, all the steps that need to be done. And I really sort of like applaud uh, Blanca and the team for delineating these steps because if you don't uh, and start to focus on different sort of cogs on this wheel of how to get there, the learning health system just remains an ideal that you know becomes a buzzword that nobody's actually doing. But this provides sort of a nice framework for, okay, so what are the actual problems we can start trying to address in order to bring a learning health system together? And what I'll talk about in the main example that I'll share in just a moment of using a clinical decision support tool um, to to, to sort of support the generation of new data, um, you know, is one way to sort of not skip, but simplify a few of these steps. So if you have a clinician deciding, I have a specific question and it applies to this patient, and so I'm gonna ask this tool, um, you sort of have them doing, to some extent, the phenotyping and patient similarity and cohort selection to help you get to the answer and generate the new evidence you need and ultimately hopefully one day get to a point where you automate more and more of that process and just you can tell somebody hey this decision support tool applies to your patient we have a recommendation for you to do so i don't know if that makes sense but i will get i will get there um, this is important. I pulled this from BMJ Clinical Evidence, which is a really nice uh, site if you haven't looked at it before. Uh, so the British Medical Journal um, sort of uh, has a warehouse of studies and treatments that have been done and then categorizes them and um, suggests uh, what is known or what is, known, or what is not known about all these treatments. So this is a, a depiction of the effectiveness of about 3,000 treatments that are in randomized controlled studies. So if randomized control studies are the gold standard, that's great as a method, um, but they don't always give you the answer because sometimes the answer is that these treatments are of unknown effectiveness. So I think the point, one point of the learning health system and the green button type idea is to say, well, at a population level, these things may be of unknown effectiveness, but for particular patients in particular circumstances, how do you use what is known and apply that to a specific patient uh, situation? And does that help you make better decisions? So a large problem because RCTs are not giving us all the answers to everything, even if they were feasible to be done for every, for every clinical situation.
So then that gets us to this more recent Institute of Medicine report um, that is concerned with uh, the learning healthcare system. So it's titled Best Care at Lower Cost, The Path to Continuously Learning Healthcare in America. Um, and sort of one of the main topics that they discuss is about knowledge generation and that it's so embedded into the core of the practice of medicine that it's a natural outgrowth and product of the healthcare delivery process and leads to continual improvement of care. So my clinical decision support tool that I'm gonna discuss in a moment uh, really has to do with the generation of new knowledge. The green button has to do with using that knowledge and applying it to patients and having access to it at the, at the point that is necessary, but you have to generate the knowledge when the knowledge doesn't exist. Um, so we've talked about this a little bit. Um, so that driving the process of discovery is a natural outgrowth of patient care. And so this lays out, um, it is broken down into these various sections and we're gonna talk through a few of them um, that uh, really help illustrate the kind of the example of the learning health system and how to make progress in this area. So to make it not just a buzzword. Um, so I, you know, I think you all might be more um, you know, familiar with this than many of my colleagues uh, in the United States when I go to, to talk to them about this. But there are two kind of interesting figures uh, in the paper. One that show, well, there's more than that, but two that I'm gonna show you. One that shows uh, traditional evidence-based practice. So, you know, when I took my clinical informatics board exam, um, sort of one of the classic teachings and questions in clinical informatics is how long does it take for discoveries uh, at the bench to, to affect patient care or get really adopted into clinical practice? Um, and the quote in the United States is often 15 or 17 years that it takes that long to get to practice because it sits in, you know, it sits in a study. And I think that timeline is getting shortened now, but it sits in a study, it makes it to a textbook, it is taught to people in medical school, and then, you know, new doctors do their thing. Blanca and I were talking about, you know, before, uh, before the talk, we were chatting about, you know, would physicians take recommendations given to them by a system based on data? And I sort of suggested that I think in some ways younger physicians would, um, because not that there's less uncertainty uh, in the decisions that more experienced physicians are making, but I think that there's um, more comfort with that uncertainty and more comfort with the way you tend to treat things. Um, but as a, as a relatively junior physician, uh, this uncertainty strikes me every day and I would actually like welcome some data to help drive the decisions that I'm making. So at any, at any rate, this um, is talking about evidence-based practice, the you know, kind of waste that happens throughout this whole system of, of getting new discoveries to the bedside. And, you know, clinical informatics has a role here in shortening this gap also because you know, using, um, you know, building evidence-based guidelines into electronic decision support tools does help, pe and order sets, does help people to do the right things even without really thinking about doing the right thing. Um, but at any rate, evidence-based practice kind of continues to have waste throughout the system and delays of uh, affecting patients. And so the, you know, the ideal of the learning health system is this you know, very pretty integrated environment where the care you provide is generating new, um, new data that is used to create new best practice guidelines and just very naturally flows back into, into the clinical care being provided. Practically doing this is um, exceedingly difficult. I'm not sure there are good examples that it's, that it's being done, but I think Blanca having broken it down uh, somewhat into component parts, you know, gives people like you and people like you know, our group a place to start to try to address some of these issues. And I will touch briefly on sort of the culture and incentives um, that uh, kind of the environment necessary to, to make this work because it is um, discussed in um, particularly the data utility section from this Institute of Medicine report. So the first recommendation in the report is uh, regarding the digital infrastructure. So um, that's to improve the capacity to capture clinical care delivery process and financial data for better care. Um, and that's essentially what I talked about at the first part of the study is getting to the step where you have electronic health records and you're collecting data electronically. Um, so you can use that data to generate new knowledge. And I know the relationship with the hospital nearby, um, given that it's a young hospital and has been basically paperless from the start, seems like a nice opportunity to influence the way that that information is collected to enable these sorts of analyses um, on the back end. 
So I'm not sure if you all had this uh, advertisement run here, but there was, um, this is the IBM data baby. Um, so there was a commercial, uh, <laughs> there was a commercial that I, as a you know, young trainee was very inspiring to me. So I share the picture here and there was a deep voice that said, this is a baby generating data in a neonatal ward. Um, and it was based, <laughs> It was based on uh, work done at um, Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto around identification of sepsis and using IBM's, um, you know, sort of Watson as applied to healthcare technology to look at all these data streams and help identify when a baby was, was gonna get sick from sepsis. The point of this is if you're collecting the data electronically, you can look at it, learn from it and monitor it. Um, and it was, you know, kind of an interesting, uh, interesting commercial if you wanna YouTube it later. Um, and so this is just a nod to uh, Royal Children's Hospital where we were this, um, this past week supporting their go live as they put in this digital infrastructure um, for uh, what's really the point. I mean, in the, in the US, unfortunately, so much of uh, our electronic health records are built to kind of support billing processes and administrative functions. But um, I guess what you know excites me about going to work is that getting this information should actually help us to take care of people better. So um, I just wanted to, you know, uh, point out that we uh, tried to help out and I'm learning a lot about uh, Australian rules football, which uh, is rapidly becoming one of my favorite sports. I can't believe it's not more popular, honestly. Um, and so you guys, uh, many of you know Vina, who's in this picture here. And so we had uh, a good time um, watching footy the other day. Um, so uh, the recommendation number two is about the data utility. And this is really gets to creating an environment that supports this type of work. Um, because in, in, I imagine, you know, research protections for patients are, um, you know, quite serious everywhere. Uh, so when you start saying, I want to just, you know, look at all the information in the system and make a decision for the next patient, there's a lot of concerns around, should you be looking at all those other people's data? And with the answer that you find, should you be applying that to a, another patient in the future? And, you know, my argument is that that's better than doing a Google search or or calling one friend, so I think you should. Um, and there are frameworks being developed to, to kind of support this work. So this is a really interesting um, paper by Ruth Faden out of Hopkins, who discussed this framework for a learning healthcare system and suggested we need a sort of a different ethical approach to justifying these sorts of activities. Um, and one of the first things they did was change the, the definition of you know, if you pressed a green button and we're basically doing a query on the system, for changing that from saying this is a research question to saying this is a learning activity. So to try to kind of break the um, so, sort of the biases related to research projects. So it defines a learning activity as one that involves the delivery of healthcare services. So you say you've pressed the green button and it tells you to do something and you are doing that using other people's individual health information. And two, has targeted objective of learning to improve clinical practice. So, you know, typically at least our, what we call our institutional review board, says this is human subjects research if the goal of it is to create generalizable knowledge. And so that becomes a sort of a major sticking point for learning healthcare systems, because if you're looking at past data to try to create generalizable knowledge to apply to people in the future. Historically, that would kind of like fit into this is human subjects research. You can't look at, there's privacy concerns. You need to consent all these people to look at their data, which you know is ba basically not feasible if you wanna do this type of work. So I'm gonna go through not all seven of these um, obligations that kind of you know, help to highlight responsibilities uh, of people doing um, learning health systems type work. Um, and, and I just think it's really interesting because uh, it includes information both about clinicians uh, and about the role in patients and the responsibility of patients to be involved in this, uh, this sort of work. Um, so there's a nice table. I'm only gonna highlight a couple of them, uh, the ones that I had on the last slide. Respecting clinician judgment. So. Um, this gets to what Blanca and I were talking about earlier is like, do doctors want to be told what to do? And, you know, probably some do and some don't. Um, but you have to acknowledge that clinician judgment may not result in the best health outcomes for patients, especially when there's an absence of good empirical evidence. So this is kind of like calling out the physician saying like, you don't always know the right thing to do. Even if you're comfortable doing that, that doesn't mean it's the right or best thing to do, do for patients. 
Um, and then getting uh, to, the, to the part about conducting continuous learning um, activities to improve quality of care um, is saying that clinicians have a responsibility to be involved in these activities. So you need to you know, be real with yourself and say, I don't always know the right thing to do. When I don't, let me you know, look at the data and try to make a better decision. Um, and that patients have an obligation to contribute too. Um, one way that this has been done at our hospital um, has been through the randomization of um, a sepsis indicator. So uh, Dr. Lance Downing is our other fellow who you haven't met. Um, maybe he, he may be recruitable, Enrico, I'm not sure. But, um, but so he's uh, Vina's counterpart in our clinical informatics program. And he um, worked on a project at Stanford to randomize through the electronic medical record a sepsis alert. Um, so this was, um, I'd say, pretty sort of a pretty groundbreaking thing at our institution because he did this without uh, cons uh, consenting individual patients. So our institutional review board deemed that all patients, when they come in and sign their consent to treatment, are attesting that they are okay being part of quality improvement work. So our IRB deemed that this sepsis alert, we didn't know if it was going to work or not work or be better for patients or worse for providers, so that this was deemed a quality improvement or learning activity. So that this could be randomized to different people in the hospital um, without the consent of patients. So patients were participating in a randomized learning activity without, without their consent. Um, so that is kind of a big deal. Work is ongoing for which he's uh, received some funding to, to do the analysis. But the whole concept of EMR randomization is one example of how you can, how clinical informatics can aid um, the progress of a learning health system. Because you, when you think about it, it can become a little complicated. You could randomize alerts by provider. You could randomize them by patient. You could randomize them by patient care area. So I think this is a really interesting uh, area of clinical informatics for, for further research and how you can generate new knowledge by randomizing um, learning activities through, through the EMR. So Lance is doing some pretty interesting, interesting work in that regard. Um, recommendation three is clinical decision support. So this is where I'm going to drill down into kind of the example of the current project I'm doing that I hope one day will be a true example of a learning uh, health system. So the point of clinical decision support in this recommendation is to accelerate integration of the best clinical knowledge into care decisions. Um, and you know, even in an evidence-based medicine type world, if you, you know, go back to that historic 17 years from you know, bench to clinical practice, um, kind of quote, clinical decision support can help shorten that gap. Because I'll tell you, what we put in order sets at the hospital is like what people end up doing because they just kind of click through and, and do, do what we say, which uh, ha has other problems related to it. But, um, but it, it, is a, it is a powerful tool. Um, what I'm going to talk about is how these tools can also be used to generate new knowledge. So Yasser is uh, one of our neonatology fellows, first year um, neonatology fellow who I've convinced that uh, informatics is a good tool um, to use uh, for his research. And so what Yasser and I created was um, a clinical decision support uh, web app called Premi Billy Rex. Um, so we didn't make this, uh, this logo, the hospital marketing people did it, but it's like kind of cool with the, with the little uh, Billy sunglasses. So I'm not sure if you're, um, you know, how familiar, or how clinical everybody is, but um, hyperbilirubinemia is kind of like the doctor word for jaundice in babies, which is a very common problem where the um, skin gets a little yellow because bilirubin builds up in the blood. Um, it's quite easy to treat if you catch it early. If you don't pay attention to it, it can have pretty serious consequences, uh, including developmental problems for, for babies. Um, we have pretty good evidence for um, term babies in what levels of bilirubin or jaundice are related to developmental problems, so we know when to initiate treatment for those kids. Um, in premature babies, the evidence is a bit more spotty, which is sort of the opportunity for a learning clinical decision support tool, um, which is what I'll talk about. So wide practice variation exists um, because uh, current practice recommendations are, are based on expert consensus and are not very discrete recommendations, which I'll, 
which I'll show you in a moment. So that's why a clinical decision support tool that can automate the existing pra best practice recommendations to standardize care and then serve as a platform for collecting data so you can actually now make data-driven treatment recommendations um, is, a, is a good approach to this problem. So um, in developing this tool, it was not as simple as, it, because the practice recommendations uh, that existed were not very discrete, um, it was not a um, straight mapping or straight, like, you know, go ahead and program this uh, problem. So these are actually the, um, the expert consensus-based recommendations. And so if, you know, anybody who's, you know, doing uh, software development in this room was told to like automate this, um, I mean, you could do it. It just wouldn't give you very specific recommendations because you can see there are sort of ranges everywhere on this sheet. So postmenstrual age is basically the age of a premature baby. So how premature they were at plus how old they are now. Um, and so term gestation is 40 weeks, um, and so this goes down to about 28 weeks. But you can see here, there are, these are basically two-week categories. So if I ask the system for a baby who's just reached their 28th week versus a baby who's reached their 29th and a half week, um, it would give you the same recommendation. Even worse than that, the recommendation it gives you would not be very clear because it would say, well, you know, if the bilirubin value is in this range, then we would say start phototherapy. So I didn't mention before, there are a couple treatments for increased jaundice. One is phototherapy, um, which is providing a specific wavelength of light that basically helps your body eliminate bilirubin more easily. Um, and then the other is, and more invasive therapy is exchange transfusion. So that's when you actually take blood out of the baby. Uh, I mean, it sounds very sort of like archaic. You take blood out of the baby that has high bilirubin in it, and then you put back in blood from the blood bank that doesn't have high bilirubin in it. So you drop their bilirubin level very quickly. Um, you might imagine that that is not uh, a trivial procedure to basically like be taking out blood and putting in blood. Um, so we would love to avoid doing this uh, when possible, which kind of turns, uh, is related to the outcomes we can track in determining what recommendations we'd be giving people. So at any rate, there is a range of age for the baby and there's a range of bilirubin values for when you should take action. So that is why such great practice variation exists because there are not clear, clear guidelines. So the first thing that Yasser and I did um, with the oversight of some of the bilirubin experts was convert those ranges into sort of discrete recommendations. So what we have here on the y-axis is the bilirubin or jaundice level of the baby. And then on the x-axis, we have the baby's age uh, in weeks. So how, how old they were when they were born plus how many weeks they've been out now. So, um, so now you could see for any bilirubin level, say, say a patient is 29 weeks um, post-menstrual age and their bilirubin level is 10. So now we can get our program to say, Yes, we would start phototherapy. So the lower lines are the thresholds at which we would start ph phototherapy. So for a higher risk infant, we'd say, you know, you should start phototherapy at a lower threshold. For a lower risk infant, you have a little more wiggle room. But at any rate, at 10, you'd say any baby at 29 weeks with a level of 10, yes, begin. Um, and similarly, these are the lines for exchange transfusion. So you can imagine for this more invasive treatment, we don't do it until your bilirubin levels are getting to what we think are dangerously high levels. And so if you're a higher risk infant, we would say to do an exchange transfusion at a lower bilirubin level. But if you're a lower risk infant, we could let that bilirubin level rise even more before doing that treatment. P part of the point of this to remember is that we have no idea if these are like the right numbers. These are just basically the expert guidelines as they exist now. Um, so the way the system works is that uh, you can either manually go to the website and put in the age of the baby and the bilirubin level, um, or you can do it in an EMR integrated fashion, which I'll show you that just passes the information along, right along from your system uh, to get the recommendation. So you don't have to look at the table and plot things out. The, the web app does that for you and it says, okay, your baby is 28 plus six and has a 9.5 bilirubin level. So we would say, you know, regardless if they were just premature or premature and high risk, we'd say go ahead and start the, the phototherapy treatment. There's sort of an analogous box for exchange transfusion if you, if you exceed those, those thresholds. And so what's nice is we built this little button into the EMR so that um, we have some control. So this gets to sort of the cohort definition step. We have some control like 
when this button displays for different patients. So this is right within the electronic chart. If a baby is premature within the range that this decision support tool um, applies and has a bilirubin number that can be sent to the tool, we display this button. So you can click the button and, and get your recommendation. The other nice thing about this is that we log every keystroke in the EMR. So we know now what babies um, have had this button clicked. So when you start thinking about, oh, I want to go back and do analysis now, see what the outcomes were for these babies, we know for, for which babies uh, this decision support tool got used on. We also know when it got used, what data was passed, and we can look and see if they've made any changes, if they followed the recommendation and started treatment or didn't do treatment. Um, so that's, uh, that's where you start to get to this generation of new data. So just using the tool itself starts to give us information about what's happening to babies when you use these thresholds. And this is assuming that people are following the threshold. So our first step in this research is actually looking back and seeing how much practice variation is there in the past and do we standardize that um, with introduction of this tool? And then the next step will be, okay, we've standardized it. How do we tune this to prevent exchange transfusions, prevent unnecessary excess phototherapy, um, and uh, you know, prevent, prevent other things. Hearing loss is one of the proximate outcomes uh, that happens when bilirubin levels get too high. So how do we make sure our treatment thresholds are um, sort of not too conservative that we're putting everybody on phototherapy unnecessarily, which can have bad consequences for skin and cancer down the line, um, but not uh, so liberal that they're having these kind of near-term uh, near issues. Um, and so we hope eventually, once we figure out, okay, what should these, what are the right levels for all patients, then how do we look at an individual patient? So a patient who is sick with sepsis. So that risk factors box is more automated rather than saying, okay, clinician, decide if you think this person's high risk or low risk. We can kind of help guide people to say, oh, you should use a more conservative threshold or, oh, you can let the, let the number go, go a bit higher. Um, so this uh, just got rolled out a few months ago. So I was telling Blanca that we have um, probably 120 to 150 of these um, premature babies um, born at our center each year. So in the first few months, um, it had been used for about 40 infants and, you know, it gets used multiple days. So the, we do end up getting a fair amount of data. If you look at this in terms of bilirubin decisions and what treatment is done afterwards. It's not as not quite as grim as only having, uh, you know, 100 patients a year. We'll have thousands of kind of decision points um, to kind of base our analysis of how this tool is working. And uh, a bunch of providers uh, are, are using it, which is great. Um, we were fortunate to, um, before the tool was even rolled out, get asked to write a, a paper in clinics and perinatology. Um, by some of the bilirubin researchers at our, um, at our institution who, who made some of the pre previous guidelines and have written the guidelines for term infants. So this is um, sort of you know, free press to get this out there because I think it'll be pretty powerful to invite other sites to kind of share their outcomes data with us to kind of help refine the recommendations that the, that the tool gives. So I'll begin uh, to start wrapping up here, but I wanted to show one other example of how clinical informatics can, um, I, I think, help uh, promote the concept of a learning health system and, and provide data related to it. Um, and that's around patient-centered care. So this is involving patients and families and decisions regarding health care um, tailored to fit their preferences. So our example with that really has to do um, with patient-generated data. I was going to go off a little bit on how health vendors say that you can uh, um, innovate on top of them and build apps. There are not great examples of that happening yet, um, but we can talk about that in question time uh, if you want. Um, what we have built um, is this is Dr. Rajiv Kumar, who's a pediatric endocrinologist uh, at our institution who has just been recruited by Apple to go you know, think stuff up with Apple, I guess. Um, but he helped pioneer this work um, on our system that we call GlueView, which allows us to do uh, blood glucose monitoring for patients who have continuous glucose monitors at home. So he basically helped rig up the data flow that goes from a patient's continuous glucose monitor device onto their mobile phone and into our electronic 
health record system so that then we can do a couple of things. One is we can run reports that kind of analyze the glucose control for a population of patients um, to see who's most at risk, having the most problems, who we should call and adjust their medications. And the second is for an individual patient creating visualizations that help us to better, better manage those patients' care. So historically, a patient may have to you know, drive several hours from their home to download this device into our system so we can start to look at information like this. But now um, the device within a few hours or whenever they're connected to Wi-Fi sends their every five minute glucose values and we're able to visualize them in this way. This is a kind of a cool visualization. It's called a modal day. So what's plotted here is actually two weeks of uh, glucose values, but overlaid in one 24 hour period. So that kind of shows you, are there certain periods of the time where their blood glucose goes down or certain periods of the day where it goes up that helps you make treatment decisions about Oh, should they be on higher or lower amounts of insulin or their, or their medication? And you can also see pretty easily, oh, there was one wacky day here, so did, was there like an ice cream party or something like that? That wouldn't warrant a treatment change. That's just this kind of like reinforcement about what you should and should and shouldn't do. Um, so I, I think patient-generated health data is another um, sort of large opportunity for um, you know, generating new knowledge by collecting this information. So I'm going to wrap up. We've talked a little bit about the digital infrastructure, which is installing electronic health record systems. Um, so the data is available for analysis. The data utility, which we sort of described as the creating an environment that's supportive of doing these types of analyses and this research on, um, on patients um, when categorized as learning activities rather than traditional research. Um, clinical decision support and the Premi Billy Rex tool. Uh, that's an example of a way to collect data and hopefully generate new evidence and one day close the loop so that that tool um, is actually learning and giving patient specific recommendations based on who's asking for the information. Uh, and then patient generated health data as another source of a lot of information that is increasingly getting um, integrated into electronic health records and, uh, and available for analysis. So um, this was a perspective written by uh, Zach Kahani and other, um, uh, other colleagues at Harvard um, a couple of years ago at talking about a glimpse of the next 100 years in medicine. And so I just sort of like this, this quote as we get to the end that has to do with sort of big data and learning healthcare systems. Um, Clinical decision support algorithms will be derived entirely from data, not expert opinion, market incentives, or committee consensus. So the Billy Rubin tool was committee consensus. The huge amount of data available will make it possible to draw inferences from observations that will not be encumbered by unknown confounding. So, you know, that's sort of a, you have to have enough data to get rid of some of the biases in the data, but uh, I think that's the idea of, uh, of saying, it's okay to not do a randomized controlled study if you look back at sufficient data to reduce the biases and confounding factors in those data. So, um, you know, what I hope to do uh, throughout my career is get to the point where we're learning from every baby generating data in a neonatal ward every day. Um, and I think that's what I want to leave you guys with and hopefully left a few minutes for discussion. Thank you. I guess I would start by saying that's, that's one reason that um, I think green button is a few steps down the line for multiple reasons. I mean, w one of those is that it, not everyone is a Dr. Jennifer Frankovich, who is the person who did the analysis on that lupus data, who both has domain expertise and the statistics background to do like a legitimate analysis. And so just creating a green button, it doesn't mean you're gonna have somebody who can uh, appropriately form a query or interpret the results of that query. So that's part of why I think these sort of decision support tools where you have guardrails, while they're not you know, realizing the, the full learning health system, like you can ask anything and get any answer you want, but there are guardrails around you know, what questions make sense to ask, what data is being looked at, and what sort of recommendations you get back. That's something that would be, I think, governor, governorable, governor, I don't know, could be governed by an institutional review board or some similar structure, whatever that structure is going to be for learning health system type tools, so that, that you could break down into components for kind of specific clinical problems or, or even in neonatology specific outcomes that you're looking at that are sort of 
approved analyses. So maybe it's not a free for all, um, but there are you know physician tunable parameters uh, with guardrails around them. And I think the challenge is when do you get them to ask the question? When do they need to know they need to ask a question, which is another sort of clinical informatics problem. I think a related comment to this is uh, the representation of uncertainty when you use these tools, because I could imagine that for some patients, you, your, you know, your data is very well fit to answer the specific question you wanted. And for some questions on some patients, actually, the data is just not fit. And so I think it's important that the tool has a capability to indicate, you know, not useful in this case, you know, proceed without even bothering to, to look at the answer, right? So that's... Please do this other test. Yeah. Yeah or, this, yeah, or this isn't helpful. I think of it in two ways. One is I'm from Florida in, in the U.S. before I moved to California, and um, we have maps of hurricanes coming at us. And it's like, today we know the hurricane is here, and then you have the uncertainty about where, where it's going to go. And the other way is we talked about airline fares already, but um, there are a couple of sites that have, uh, you know, we think the price is going up with this amount of certainty around it. Um, and in healthcare specifically, I've seen examples of uh, pharmacokinetics tools specifically that say, you know, something doesn't seem right here. I don't know if it's the info you're putting in or what's clinically going on with the patient, but it's not like fitting our recommendation tool very well. So proceed with caution. At a population level for everyone, I think it's a little difficult um, to say. I, I would say if you break it down into clinical problems, then you can start figuring out the answer to that. So one example that we're starting to think of along the same vein as the continuous glucose monitor data because the, the pipeline for the flow of data would be the same even though it's different data, is for our, some of our congenital heart disease patients. So we already have a home monitoring program for our congenital heart disease patients who we know are gonna need two or three surgeries um, until they, their hearts are either totally fixed or they need a heart transplant. And so what this home monitoring program does is collects information on an ongoing basis to help determine when does that baby need to come back for their second surgery. And so in a system like that, the information they're collecting is like the patient's weight, which there are ways to collect that um, through health kit integrated apps, um, the patient's uh, oxygen saturations, uh, and the patient's blood pressure. So if we can automate the way um, that the process that's already happening for home monitoring where people are calling these patients uh, to get this information and log it in a book and then decide whether they come back, um, to have that flowing in so that the, a report can just be running in the background and saying, hey, it looks like this person's getting close, reach out to them. That's one example. In adult medicine, which I know you're more interested in heart failure, which it would be a very similar example where you're following the, the patient's weight primarily, um, and there are certainly connected devices that could help to do that. Following weight may be more interesting from a more global population perspective anyways, actually. Wait longer, I guess, is the, is the way to ask for more. So I, I would say we were talking about specifically related to my, um, you know, sort of dream to create at least a micro learning health system around newborn intensive care. Um, you know, if we have 120 or so of these babies a year, I know that that's not going to be enough when some of these outcomes happen like 1% to 5% of the time in those kids to draw any meaningful conclusions. So uh, one way I'm thinking about asking for more data is to um, talk to like statewide and national collaboratives to collect the information you would need for these analyses. What's challenging is that they're already set up to give some, some demographic info about the patients and some outcome info, but like what actually happened and you know what, where there were decision points and how you could affect those outcomes in the, in the hospital are not captured. So we talked a little bit about before, um, you know, could I take one problem like a, what's called a patent ductus arteriosus, a heart blood vessel that is open in fetal life and is supposed to close in newborn life, and there's nobody knows what actually to do with it. Certainly at a population level, there's no answer. It seems like it helps some patients, but not others. How can I get like a statewide collaborative to help start collect the data that is made or that helps make decisions around times of treatments for those things so that you get broad population data rather than within one center. So I think that's a very valid problem and we generally need more data. Mm -hmm.
already in the states, EHRs are certified as ones that at least can provide the functions that get you to meaningful use. Um, some of that has to do with sharing uh, data externally, but not necessarily to be able to do studies across different systems. Um, I would say that's a there are sort of vendor specific um, features of different systems that make some better suited and some uh, less well suited to do that sort of work. Um, so Cerner um, historically has been touted as a, as a system that you can really modify a lot locally to help meet your needs, which as, as you know, will um, kind of shoot yourself in the foot in trying to compare across different sites because there is maybe very um, few things similar between one Cerner implementation and another. Um, I know they're doing work with uh, multiple institutions on being able to do larger scale data analyses. So hopefully some of the databases that they're creating, which you know likely are sucking information out of their transactional database, will allow for some of those comparisons to be made. Epic, in contrast, has been criticized as being a system that you cannot innovate on top of very much and uh, you know move away from the um, kind of standard build that they create. Um, the first, I'm not sure that that's entirely true, but second, uh, one thing that that actually supports is normalization of data across sites. So Epic has set up uh, a few databases. They have their kind of transactional database for you know, entering orders on the for frontline providers. They have their Clarity database. Um, which uh, allows for querying and, and analysis to be done. And now they have a newer thing called their Kogado database, which is another relational database that um, serves to normalize data coming from any Epic site into this Kogado data warehouse structure. And so the vision for that is that multiple sites would be able to then contribute and compare analyses across. You can imagine that with each step from the transactional database to the kind of reporting uh, database to the you know, broadly, uh, the broad database for multiple sites, the amount of information that makes its way into each one of those is progressively like less and less has been normalized for use across other sites. Uh, and then another big challenge is that even though this framework sort of exists, I'm not sure that there's any hospital yet that has allowed another hospital to like look at their look at their information. Um, so much of the way that I think that sort of work is happening is through um, either quality collaboratives or um, other national registries where you are in a purpose-driven way getting data from multiple sites that goes into a single format to, to answer questions. And that doesn't get to a learning health system that gets to you know silos of learning health examples, but um, I think those are the most sort of proximate opportunities. So this gets a, yeah a little bit back to some of my um, you know my like little gripe with Epic or whatever, but it's really with health vendor health system vendors in general. Um, so there there are basically web tools that exist that allow you to send data out of your system to web services. Um, supposedly there are APIs that exist that allow you to perform functions or um, kick off functions from outside your system and have them happen inside your system. I haven't seen an actual example of that. For instance sending your data to the Billy Rubin site, it telling you to start phototherapy, and you clicking on the website and that generating an order back in your system. Um, so the theoretically, um, using Fire and other API kind of interfaces that could be possible. Uh, and Epic says it's kind of possible, but I haven't seen it actually done. So one of my goals actually in the next year uh, is related to this Billy Rubin website. Um, you know, I have friends who want to create whole clinical pathways that, you know, you, you click one button on a website and it makes a whole order set in your system and kicks off a whole bunch of events. But uh, all I want to try to do is turn on phototherapy or turn off photo, like one single order and see if that's even possible because I'm, I'm not sure it is actually, it, it has not been demonstrated because I can, you know, I, I can understand Epic's reluctance to give up what is one of their core functionalities, allow people to be doing that from the outside. So. Okay, let's thank you. Thank you again. Thanks so much.